Great, and thank you, Rebecca. Um, this is uh, obviously a timely and important topic. Um, in the, the, last, uh, the last several weeks, we've seen uh, a number of incident, incidences on college campuses where students' First Amendment rights are being violated. It's also timely, though, because, uh, as many of you may have heard, the Department of Justice actually uh, filed a brief in one of our student free speech cases just this past week. Um, and uh, we're grateful for uh, Attorney General Sessions making the statement that he did at Georgetown just down the road uh, earlier this week advocating uh, for free speech on campus and actually saying that the Department of Justice is actually going to get involved as it, as it did in one of our cases uh, this week and actually start advocating for the First Amendment on campus. I think that is a, uh, a very healthy and positive development. Um, but while we're waiting for the cavalry, uh, cavalry to arrive uh, from DOJ, there's a lot that has to be done uh, to protect free speech on campus and our broader free speech culture. And I think that's where this conversation is going to go uh, today. So um, let's begin first with just some opening comments uh, from the panelists. And I'll, I'll begin uh, immediately to my right here with Connor. When I travel to college campuses as a journalist, I'm, I'm first there to understand what people are thinking and trying to draw them out in interviews and conversations. Um, and later as an opinion journalist to persuade people to sometimes adopt a new view, and certainly to persuade readers to adopt a new view. And on college campuses, I've come to the understanding that a lot of students now regard the First Amendment primarily as a tool that is protecting the privileged and the powerful. Um, that was quite counterintuitive to me, uh, if only as an abstract matter, it's of course something that is protecting speech uh, that the government would otherwise be punishing. And one thing I've tried to do uh, in print is to explain the history of speech codes uh, as they happened the last time our culture was in a moment of let's worry a lot about uh, speech on college campuses. And that was in the late 80s and early 90s when there were a few public universities that passed speech codes. And in, in the short window between when uh, the speech codes were passed and when they were knocked down by the courts as a violation of the First Amendment, uh, you, you got a little window into what a uh, world with these speech codes would look like. And what it looked like was that in just about every case, the speech codes were passed with the idea of protecting students from historically marginalized backgrounds. And yet, in every case, the speech codes uh, punished more students of color than white students when they were actually implemented. And I bring this message to college campuses, and there's skepticism about it. I, I often will pull up on my phone articles on the internet. Henry Louis Gates, uh, the head of Africana Studies at Harvard University, wrote a fantastic article about this in, I think, 1992 in The New Republic. Uh, and, and this history that, this lesson that the left once learned for a brief moment has, has kind of been lost to time. Um, th there was an editorial in the student newspaper at Wesleyan where uh, the editors of that paper took umbrage at the people that were saying, oh, you guys are against free speech. And, and they said, we're not against free speech, we're against hate speech. Um, and another, point I try to bring home is that if you are a leftist college student, uh, your idea of hate speech, whatever it is, is probably very different from the idea of hate speech that Donald Trump and Attorney General Jeff Sessions and the Republican legislators that control various states, the way that they would define hate speech. Uh, it, it seems to me an incredibly short-sighted thing for the left at this moment, and any political coalition generally, because the other side is always going to be in power at some point, um, to just cede the power to someone else to decide what hate speech is. There's pretty broad survey data that shows that a bunch of different Americans, if given the chance, kind of favor uh, restricting a bunch of different kinds of speech. And in that survey data, there's almost certainly something you believe that someone else wants to prohibit. Um, I'm also struck by the way that the First Amendment is able to spare us all of these fights. There are just lots of things that we don't have to worry about and fight about because it is there ensuring that everyone's ox can be gored and that there is a certain equity in the fact that whatever any of us hold sacred, someone can attack it. 
And once you start crossing one thing off of that list, uh, everyone else thinks, well, wh why isn't my thing as important as that exception that you already made? Um, I just close by saying that the civic ignorance you see around First Amendment issues uh, is pretty alarming at the moment. Um, just a misunderstanding about what it means and, and, and more broadly a culture of free speech and why a culture of free speech is important. Um, another thing we're seeing on college campuses now, um, I sometimes talk about a Fourth Amendment problem, uh, which is to say the Fourth Amendment is usually defended when a criminal is caught and the police did something wrong and you are always in the position of defending a criminal if you're defending the Fourth Amendment, just about. That's where all the case law comes from. The First Amendment has a problem right now because the most hateful speakers are being associated with the First Amendment and the people who care about free speech, I think, need to do a better, ex a better job of airing historical examples of when sympathetic figures were protected by the First Amendment and by publicizing the survey data that shows all the things that Americans would make illegal to bring home the fact that almost everyone has something to gain by strong free speech protections. Okay. Guy, go ahead. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Thanks to ADF for hosting this and you guys for being here. And I know I think we're streaming this online, so if you're watching, thanks. Um, clearly, this is an issue that matters a lot to me. I co-wrote a whole book about it with Mary Catherine Ham two years ago. We had the new edition come out just in August uh, because when we first published the book in 2015, Donald Trump had not announced that he was running for president yet. That happened a week after the book came out, so it didn't even mention his name. And we sort of felt like with Donald Trump now being president and Berkeley on fire, maybe we should revisit the subject a little bit. Um, and so it's, it's a passionate uh, subject in my mind, uh, at least that I'm passionate about. Um, and the original, so you may not know this, but uh, it's true, under federal law, uh, every conservative book must have a short, snappy title and then a very long subtitle. Um, this is the this was the Ann Coulter Act, I believe, was the uh, the name of the legislation. So I think her next book is uh, the working title. I think is Pedophiles: Why Every Liberal in America Should Be Decapitated. I think <laughs> it's it's give or take. Um, so ours was end of discussion. How the left's outrage industry shuts down debate, manipulates voters, and makes America less free and fun. Um, and we pin most of this problem on the left, and we believe that's a defensible position for a number of reasons. The left controls a lot of the taste-making institutions in America, academia, um, the entertainment community, most of the media. Um, but we also address, and this is something I think we're seeing more and more, this is not a problem that solely exists on the left. So the issue as we see it is sort of how people try to win debates culturally or politically by preventing those debates from happening. Um, and I think really at the core of this is the impugning of motives. Uh, this is a crisis in our country on both sides where people are inclined to believe the worst possible caricature of why the other side believes what they do. And when you're starting from that as your sort of your touchstone about how you're going to enter a debate. If you think the other side are a bunch of terrible, horrible, hateful, anti-American people, uh, it becomes a lot easier to justify in your mind shutting them down or stamping out their views because you know, that's what's required to have a, a just community or however you, wanna, um, however you wanna sort of spin it a little bit. So I think the impugning of motives is um, a really, really serious problem and it forces or tempts a lot of people, I should say, to take intellectual shortcuts um, to you know, assign uh, bad sounding words to someone else saying, okay, well, if you believe that, you're a somethingist, um, or you hate the country, or whatever, and therefore you are unworthy of being taken seriously, or unworthy of debating with, because you're bad, you are bad, you are evil, um, Therefore, this discussion doesn't need to continue because uh, it's, it's problematic for you to even be uh, part of the conversation. That is, I think, at the root of a lot of this. Um, and so 
I would just say to close, we're going to have a lot of time to talk about these things. Uh, while I stand by the thesis that this is more of a problem on the left, I think what we have seen in the backlash to this phenomenon is that the impulse of authoritarianism, the impulse of squelching uncomfortable thoughts or offense things that offend you uh, is, is not the sole province of, of any political party or either side. And uh, we are seeing in, in vivid color how the right and the rights outrage industry shuts down debate and makes America less free and fun. Um, so I would close by thanking any of you who, all of you for being here, but especially if you are someone who considers him or herself left of center. Um, we, we need this to not be a partisan ideological issue. We need this to be uh, across the proverbial aisle where people who care about ideas, uh, people who care about the freedom to express ideas, and understand that testing the principle of free speech sometimes requires defending very objectionable speech, that we need to link arms together and stand up against sort of the outrage mobs on either side of this question uh, whose very illiberal, illiberal uh, impulses I think are really a threat, frankly, to the country. Because if we cannot talk to each other about our challenges that we face, um, we're not going to solve any of them. We're going to get in our tribalist corners, shout at each other, impugn each other's motives, and accomplish nothing. And that is not a healthy path forward for a republic. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Hi, y'all. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm roughly the same age as many of the students that are protesting and freaking out and almost kind of literally setting themselves on fire and bashing ATMs machines over speakers that they don't like, right? So, you know, seeing this play out, I'm the same age as a lot of these individuals. I'm like, you know, what's going on? And I think um, I wanted to share a little bit about my background. I went to Patrick Henry College, a school that proudly rejects uh, federal funding so that way they don't have to comply, you know, with uh, the ongoing Department of Education's um, willy-nilly restrictions on speech that I think the Obama administration has weaponized. Um, anyway, so I think that the background in my educational experience kind of saved me or kept me away from seeing a lot of these tensions, this rise of, oh, we can't listen to d ideas that we disagree with because they're dangerous. Um, so, you know, as someone who's the same age as a lot of these protesters who are freaking out, um, I kind of am looking at it like, okay, I don't understand, you know, what's going on, why they're doing that. Um, so I think that that bit of introduction brings us to the question at hand, which is why is this happening, right? That's what we're here to talk about today. Why are college students freaking out? Why is free speech a controversial topic? Why do we need a bunch of police officers guarding us here today to talk about this, right? And so I really think that uh, the reason why all of this is happening really boils down to two things. Number one, I think that there's just really widespread ignorance about what freedom of speech means and what the rights that we have as Americans uh, that are guaranteed to us by the Constitution. And I think that millennials are dumb. Um, I think, first of all, I want to say that they are very well-intentioned. A recent survey of millennials asked them, you know, hey, do you guys think religious freedom is important? And 95% of them said, yes, absolutely, this is so important. Um, but in that same survey, when they were pressed a little bit about that, they an overwhelming majority said that businesses should be compelled to serve gay couples and participate in same-sex weddings and bake cakes with pro-LGBT messages. And I think that those conflicting responses really do show that millennials don't understand uh, what free speech means, what freedom of free exercise of religion means, they don't understand the First Amendment, and they don't understand a lot of the rights that are guaranteed to us by the Constitution. Um, however, I don't really think that millennials are to blame for this widespread problem, right? I think that it's not just millennials who are struggling to understand all of these rights, it's Americans in general. Uh, only one in five college students, college graduates, I should say, um, can name a single freedom that's protected under the First Amendment, and only half of the country um, can even name all three branches of government, right? So I think that this kind of widespread ignorance is to blame for a lot of what we are seeing today. But also I think the funding structure 
uh, and the way that higher education is funded really does have a big impact. And I think, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Obama administration really did weaponize Title IX um, and weaponize the Department of Education in the way that they were to hand out those funds. I, it's borne out time and time again, you know, the Department of Education wrote letters to colleges saying, hey, you guys have to do X, Y, Z. You have to um, make your, uh, you, you have to make your own tribunals when it comes to sexual assault cases. You have to do all of these extra things. Um, and you know, I think that when the Department of Education decided to do that, I think that they decided to weaponize free speech. Um, and when they did change some of the sexual assault policies, they told colleges, hey, you have to treat um, even just sexual harassment or catcalling as if it's sexual assault, right? So I think that that's one example in the way that speech has been weaponized and is treated as if it's like an assaulting, you know, violent force for evil. Um, so I think that those are really two of the big things going on here. And there's a couple other factors as well that we can probably hash out sure. <laughs> as we <Sure>. go on <laughs> in this discussion. Well, thank you. So um, let's let's dive in. I want to drill down on this problem a little bit and exactly what we are experiencing on college campuses. We've heard some numbers already. Um, I'll, I'll give you just a few. So Brookings Institution recently released uh, a survey that a lot of us have, have seen showing that 44%, 44% of college students believe that hate speech is not protected by the First Amendment. And one in five think it's acceptable to use violence to stop a speaker from me making uh, what they deem to be an offensive statement. So Bree, you're a millennial. Um, you understand avocado toast. Um, are these numbers? I make it for myself I quite figure that's, frequently, that probably, actually, right, right. yeah. So um, being close to the age of these college students, do, do those sorts of numbers resonate with you? Does that sound like the, uh, the environment that, uh, that you are seeing on college campuses? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this isn't the only survey to kind of back that up. Right, I mean, the Washington Post had a recent survey uh, where they were talking to incoming freshmen, and 43% of them said that uh, speakers with you know extreme views should be blocked from coming onto campus. And again, I think that this really has to do with widespread ignorance and just a misunderstanding of what rights we have guaranteed to us as citizens. Um, and also, last year. This was a really interesting tidbit. Um, with the rise of Bernie Sanders, a lot of college students, you know, were pretty supportive of him. Um, but I think seventy, something like seventy percent of college students couldn't really define what socialism meant. Um, <laughs> so I think that's kind of important, right? If you're going to be backing a certain political ideology in a candidate. Uh, who represents that ideology, I think that you should understand it. And the fact that they don't, I think, just underscores that there's just massive widespread um, ignorance among millennials and among Americans in general. And honestly, I think our educational system is to blame. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the funding structure um, of higher education, I mean, these are things that aren't just happening at the college level, right? Last year, the Department of Education sent out letters to every school district in the country and said, hey, you guys better let uh, you know, boys who say that they're girls into whatever bathroom that they want, because if you don't, we're going to yank your funding from you. So I do think that this kind of weaponization that we are seeing and the way that the purse strings are handled in our educational system, starting at very early ages, has a big role to do with this also. So uh, you mentioned a number there, uh, and this is actually a, a poll that the First Amendment Center put together, I think, uh, that showed that 43% of respondents not just college students, 43% of all respondents uh, favored universities banning controversial speakers. Uh, this is the 2017 First Amendment Center uh, poll. So Guy and Connor, uh, we'll kind of begin with you, Connor, and then go to you, Guy. Um, is this really a millennial problem, or is this actually a much bigger cultural problem? I think it's a bigger cultural problem. Um, I think that the First Amendment and the culture of free speech more broadly has been challenged in different ways in just about every generation. And just about every generation has had to fight um, to protect and expand these rights. Um, I think that there are parts of what we're seeing on academia that are very much grounded in uh, things like critical race theory and the sorts of academics who argue that causing someone stress does them physical harm over the long term. And so we, so we should treat speech as something like um, physical assault. Uh, th there are these ideas that have kind of grown up in corners of campus, but, but I also think that 
there's this really interesting social science experiment that was done in two towns in Colorado, Boulder, which is very liberal, and Colorado Springs, which is relatively conservative. And the social scientists got two groups of people from these cities and put them in a room together and had them talk about uh, a few hot button issues for a uh, fixed amount of time. And it turned out that the people in Colorado Springs and the people in uh, Boulder, whatever their pre-existing positions were, the people in Boulder came out even farther to the left on these issues that they discussed. And on the same issue, the people in Colorado Springs came out even further to the right. And not only were their views more extreme, they were more certain that they were right and they were less willing to hear uh, other views. Uh, I think one thing that you're seeing on college campuses is a kind of sorting, not only by class, but also by like, you're talking about literally admissions officers at some of the smaller colleges who are hand selecting students that share something in common. Uh, I think maybe that has led to kind of more extremeness and a little bit more intolerance of hearing different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And that hopefully we'll be in better shape in society as a whole than college campuses, which are this very particular insular environment. Uh, but we're kind of sorting in society as a whole into we're living in towns near the same kinds of people. We're sorting ideologically a little bit more. So maybe that's part of what's going on. Right. Well, and then social media for that matter, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, big guy. Well, I, I do think, and you both touched on it now, this conflation of speech with violence, uh, I think is very alarming because it's just a total fallacy and it's used to justify violence in some cases. If, if offensive speech is violence, Therefore, violence is, to some people, seen as like an acceptable response uh, or an acceptable preemptive uh, effort to make sure that that other violence doesn't happen through your own violence or something. It's, it's, <laughs> it requires some intellectual gymnastics, but it's, it's where we are for a lot of people. So the, the survey uh, that just came out uh, is definitely alarming and depressing on a number of levels, but you still have 80% of college students who respond uh, to that Brookings survey who say, no, violence is not an acceptable response to this. Um, that's good. That's a super majority. You know, you can, you can have, and, and one thing that was interesting, of the roughly one out of five students who said it is acceptable, physical violence, it was almost evenly split among self-identified liberals and conservatives. It was not slanted in either direction, uh, which I think busts a few narratives. Um, and then in terms of this whole notion of hate speech, uh, fortunately there's quite a lot of precedent that hate speech is protected under the First Amendment. Um, you can loathe the speech and appreciate the protection of it uh, anyway. Um, and one of the fundamentally, to me, obvious points to make is the term hate is very subjective. And so there's a, there's a great uh, guy on Twitter um, named Iowa Hawk blog. That's, I highly recommend him, he's a great follow. And he was in a debate with someone about hate speech about these questions and he finally said, okay, here's the deal. You can ban hate speech and I get to define hate speech. And I think that hopefully is like a, just a, a clear self-evident truth that might make someone stop for just a second. As Connor said, you, know, you might love this idea of banning hate speech until you recognize that the people in power who might be able to actually enforce such a ban are people like Jeff Sessions and Donald Trump. And if you don't think that's a particularly attractive um, idea, then you can appreciate why someone else may not like the idea of Eric Holder uh, or Hillary Clinton if she had won, what happened? Um, do, making these decisions. And so I think the, the principled, consistent thing for all of us ought to be, let's not put these decisions in the hands of government partisans. Let's protect everyone's speech. Um, and I also, I, l the last point I would make on this is the abuse of terms like hate and the over application of terms like hate. Um, is a real problem. The fact that our hosts today, um, Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, have been labeled a hate organization by the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, which is this left-wing group that the media takes seriously for some reason, um, 
this is when you're when you're labeling like actual neo Nazis and also ADF under the same umbrella of hate, something has gone terribly awry and wrong. And I think there's like a boy who cried wolf phenomenon where when you start applying these types of terms, bigotry, racism, homophobia, hate, you know, hatefulness, when you start applying that to every group or person or uh, way of thinking or worldview that you don't like, that you disagree with, as a means of delegitimizing that, you are really um, watering down and diluting what those words ought to really mean because genuine bigotry and racism and hate exists. And we saw some of it in Charlottesville with torches and chanting. It's real and it's horrific. When we are taking when we're running out of words to describe how bad that is because the words that we would typically use are casually bandied about all the time to demonize sort of prosaic <laughs> political disagreements, that's a problem. Um, and so I'll probably come back to this well a few times today, but I really do focus or try to focus on the mode of impugning issue. And by no means, I'm not like holding myself up as the, like the perfect person here. I, I'm, in fact, in our book, we gave examples not just of you know, the left's problems, but we also gave examples on our own side. And we decided, well, maybe we shouldn't just say our own side, because like, well, some on our side have been very bad on this, unlike us, because we're enlightened. So we went and actually, I gave an example of where I personally contributed to this problem, right? I think some of this requires introspection and self-reflection and sort of like, okay, it's really easy to get upset when the other side is doing something that annoys or offends you and do something about it, like write a whole book. <laughs> um, but what about when you are sort of doing kind of the same thing? Is that all of a sudden okay? And, and one quick example is, what was that, a few weeks ago, we had the entire center right just beside ourselves and rightly so, parentheses, over Google firing this engineer who wrote a controversial memo, internal memo, uh, that you know, was perpetuated gender stereotypes, I believe is what Google said. And he was critical of sort of an insular left-wing worldview at Google, and they said, you're wrong and you're fired. Um, and the whole center right was like, oh my god, this is exactly the problem. And then the president, a few days ago, comes out and says, these NFL kneelers better fire those sons of bitches. And all, a bunch of us said, yeah, fire those <laughs> SOBs. Stand for the flag, mofos. Um, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, there's a tension here, guys. Like, if we're all running to the ramparts to defend James Damore from his Google firing and saying you know, political speech shouldn't be a fireable offense in America, and then say, oh, but we don't like that speech over here, so fire their asses. Um, that is, there's a word, hip, hip, some, hypocrisy, uh, and we need to be aware of that and try to guard against it and not constantly get in this like one-upsmanship of an arms race of outrage and scalp collecting where it's like, well, that's their rules, so we're going to do it to them, and then we just, it's mutually assured speech destruction, and I'm against it. I think just to highlight one point you made, uh, the thorniness of trying to define hate if we mm -hmm. are going to ban hate speech. If you think about, um, a lot of people think hate speech and they think the people who were marching in Charlottesville with Nazi signs and, and Ku Klux Klan garb. And I, I would argue that whatever we want to call that thing, we need a word that's different from hate to distinguish it from, um, I mean, surely it's literally hate speech if I say I hate Donald Trump, or I hate that person who was convicted of murder. I, I take the point that we should all try and find uh, Christian love in our hearts and hate no one. Um, but surely there are a lot of people who hate things that we find odious, and we don't particularly blame them when we don't really want to stigmatize someone who says, uh, you know, if Mothers Against Drunk Driving hates drunk drivers, if one of the people in that organization hates someone who got drunk and killed someone, uh, we're not talking about that speech when we talk about hate speech. And so I think the word itself is almost, 
inapt. And it, it, the fact that we can't even find a word to describe the thing that we ostensibly want to ban, it's not that we can't agree with the word meaning. We can't even find an accurate word. Right. So Connor, I, actually, I wanted to come to you on this and ask, you know, particularly the themes of your, your, uh, your most recent, uh, or the article that you wrote sort of uh, along these lines, where you're talking about the, the problem that the left, or where the left should be deeply concerned um, about uh, trying to apply this, you know, give the power to the government to limit hate speech. Um, because of the, the impact that free speech uh, has had, actually, on minority communities. Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about that? Uh, it, it's, I mean, the core of the First Amendment is just protecting speech that the government or a majority of the people would otherwise ban. And who is that always going to protect? Uh, it, marginalized groups, by definition. And you can look in the past and see anti-war activists using the First Amendment to great effect, the civil rights era marchers using it to great effect. Um, right now, if you look in the polling data and you look at the ways that the right is most antagonistic to the First Amendment, uh, it's the alarming number of people who want to be able to ban the construction of mosques in their community. We think of the First Amendment as being about speech, it's also about religion. Um, it, it's just, um, I think that some on the left maybe look back at the Vietnam era protests and the civil rights era protests and uh, think that those are things in the past. It, it, it's a kind of weird tension um, in, in the left world on campuses where on one hand people are saying, oh, we live in um, a white supremacist country. Uh, well, if you really believe that, then you should be adamant that there are these protections in the Bill of Rights that are going to protect you from this majority that you think um, is racist, right? Uh, and I would just argue that we're not at some weird end of history point where there's never going to be another struggle from a group that starts out on the wrong side of public opinion and that a couple decades from now we think, oh, wow, uh, everybody got it wrong back then. Right. And uh, the illusion that we are at that kind of end of history point, I think kind of, uh, maybe it's common to everyone, but, but I think uh, the campus left is really missing it in this right. important way. Right. Fukuyama was wrong. <laughs> um, so every brief that we file at, at ADF um, contains, uh, with the Center for Academic Freedom, contains the phrase, college campuses are the marketplace of ideas. And every time I write it, I feel more and more awkward having to write those words because they seem like I'm, I'm talking from a, an alternate universe um, because that's just not what's happening. How did we get from uh, the place where in the, you know, back in the, in the, the 60s, you had the free speech movement at Berkeley. Um, how did we get from that to here? And I realize that's an entire separate <laughs> panel. Um, but I want to start with you, Bree, and uh, I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are on how did, how did we get to this place on campus? Sure. Um, as I said, I do think that, uh, well, t one big example, I mean, since the 1960s, there's been Title IX, right? I think that that's been a huge, had a huge impact on the way that um, colleges react. And I think that there's a lot of nervous administrators on college campuses who, you know, are worried about uh, speech or Halloween activities that their <laughs> students want to participate in. Um, and so they're, you know, putting together these bias response teams and, uh, Dep deputizing, sorry, I can talk. <laughs> deputizing other like administrators under them in order to go out and like actively enforce speech codes and actively enforce um, political correctness to make sure that there are no Title IX violations, right? That they don't get any complaints from individuals who feel that they're assaulted by cultural appropriation or wearing sombreros or different mi microaggressions like that. Um, because they don't want their purse strings to be cut off, right? I think that that's really what a lot of this comes down to is that their funding is implicitly, you know, braided together uh, with speech codes and with political correctness and with all of these things because of Title IX. Okay. I, I think we've also seen uh, a, a rise in this uh, sentiment that you sort of have a right to be not offended. Um, and not be subjected to ideas that make you uncomfortable. And 
as that has taken root, you also have a lot of administrators who were a problem, frankly, is adults not acting as adults on campus and sort of treating students as, as clients who need to be coddled and catered to as opposed to educated and um, kept in line and at least defending fundamental uh, constitutional rights, particularly as it uh, applies to state schools, um, government schools. Uh, and, and one, I think, one example that we've seen at the University of Missouri, uh, there's been a bit of a, of a course correction uh, because all of this, this whole phenomenon got totally out of control at Mizzou a few years ago. And now uh, applications and enrollments are, have plummeted. Um, they've had to shutter a number of dorms. Um, they've had funders uh, cut, off, cut off the school from money. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that the example in Missouri is putting fear into college administrators elsewhere that if, they, if this goes too far in the wrong direction, there's actually really negative consequences mm -hmm. where people vote with their feet. Parents and students don't want to go to that type of school. So that, in some way, is kind of the market uh, mitigating a problem, or at least sending signals that people ought to pay attention to. But when we talk about this, you know, I go back to, it's human nature, you go back to your own personal experience. So I'm about to go to my 10-year college reunion, which is a stunning sentence for me to be saying, because I cannot believe it's been 10 years. That's really scary, and I'm super old. And so class of 2007 at Northwestern uh, in Chicago. And I was, prepare yourselves, kind of a nerd uh, in college. Uh, wasn't always one of the coolest kids. Um, yeah, it's very hard to believe, especially considering my just, I exude coolness now. Uh, so uh, I lived voluntarily in a politically themed dorm. Um, I was like, yes, sign me up for that. Um, and we would have every, I think it was, it was like Thursday nights, like a big going out night. We're like, no, no. We're going to gather in our basement and have coffee and conversation, because it's a very sophisticated group of undergraduates. Uh, and it would be like, OK, everyone get in a circle. Abortion, go. Um, and as you imagine, much persuasion was done. Um, but actually, some was. And we would have these long, messy, weird, sometimes obnoxious and stupid arguments with each other and they would sometimes the official you know two hours would end and it would spill off into someone's suite and you would keep talking and it'd be three in the morning and someone would order Papa, Papa John's and you would keep talking about stuff and I am confident that if those conversations were recorded uh, I probably said some problematic things um, at the time like things that would be a problem <laughs> Uh, because you're sort of, you know, in hour three of this debate, you're reaching for examples and, and not maybe grasping the best ones. Um, but the upshot of those experiences were I entered college as a very dogmatic right-wing conservative, and I just memorized the position on each issue and checked the box and knew what my arguments were supposed to be. And by the end of college, and having gone through this stuff, I started to recognize where my arguments were really bad. So I'd be arguing you know, uh, for the death penalty, for example, and I turned against the death penalty because other people were making arguments that I hadn't thought of before and because I found myself repeating things that I didn't maybe really actually believe if I had to really examine it. So I moved farther to the right on some things and moved to the center or even the left on other things. And I saw that also happening with some of my friends and, and um, fellow students. And it, like, that is the marketplace of ideas, Casey, that you talk about. That is what we ought to be doing. Um, and sometimes it's messy and not perfect, and we would have been reported to every diversity officer, I'm sure, you know, and free speech, I don't know what they even, like, liaison, and, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it was worthwhile, and it helped shape my worldview in a way that I'm very grateful for. And I just, I worry that that's not necessarily possible a lot of places now. And that, it hasn't been that, 10 years is a long time, but not that long. I think um, one of the reasons for, um, for some of the trends that it sounds like all of us up here are alarmed by is just a growth in administrators on campus. Mm -hmm. And you make the administration big enough and all those people will find things to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to push back a little bit against the idea, I mean the comparison of the free speech movement at Berkeley um, 
The free speech movement at Berkeley was the bleeding radical edge of Berkeley students at the time, not the median Berkeley student at the time. It isn't clear to me that the median Berkeley student at the time had uh, views toward free speech that are friendlier to the median student now. Mm -hmm. um, the head of Berkeley, uh, the faculty of Berkeley, surely have views that are friendlier to free speech than the faculty and the administration at right. Berkeley when they were having to protest to even talk about the war on campus. Uh, and in fact, for all the trouble that there's been in Berkeley around uh, speeches getting canceled, um, the administration of Berkeley actually hasn't been that bad. They've been trying to hire security, and it's really um, outside groups coming in in numbers from Oakland. And I mean, they have a tremendous problem. The source of the problem isn't the administration there. So, so I think you do have, um, you know, certainly you can write things in the student newspaper uh, that you couldn't have in the 1960s without getting in trouble. Certainly you can display art and have performances and do lots of expressive activity on campuses today that are protected in a way that it wasn't decades ago. Um, and there was a tremendous problem with uh, both left and a little bit of right wing violence back in the late 60s and early 70s where you had hundreds of thousands sometimes of bombs going off, small ones, but in, in the country over the course of the year. And so, it, Again, I just think every generation has challenges to free speech, and we have some really alarming intellectual trends and uh, alarming things that are happening. I, I don't think that we're at some kind of um, waning you know, spot in, in the free speech continuum or the expressive continuum, and, and that we can look at the past with rose-colored glasses that aren't always accurate. So. I'm curious as to whether the um, the environment we're seeing on campus, because usually when we when we talk about the free speech problem, people are normally thinking these days about the campus free speech problem. Um, but we have a much broader, I think, free speech problem as you look at some of the surveys and and just Twitter. I mean, every everything uh, you know, every kind of event that happens, it's clear that uh, that people are looking for ways to stifle other people's speech, or at least don't have the default understanding that, well, look, it's okay that people think different things from me, and I shouldn't be outraged. Um, I should, should tone this down. Which direction did this go? Uh, is, the, is the campus free speech problem a product of the broader cultural um, problem, or is it the opposite way? Uh, is, the, is what has been happening on campuses now starting to impact the rest of culture? We'll First of all, I'd like to push back a little bit on the idea that the Berkeley administrators were really great uh, about, okay, I guess the most recent example would be, you know, Ben Shapiro's speech on campus, right? They, they did end up relenting and accommodating him, but after they had to pay an arm and a leg in security fees, which is not unlike what happened at this event today with the administration uh, here at GW. So I do think, you know, it's very clear that the administration, the administrators, while they did in fact relent at the end, um, they did give Young America's Foundation a really hard time, charged them a lot of money, uh, canceled the event and then put it back on and then canceled the event and put it back on. Um, After so, three previous events had been canceled. Right, right. With the all these thing got canceled, the jumping thing through got hoops. Canceled. They said you, you can have a conservative speaker, but you have to pay $10,000 in security fees. It has to be off campus. It has to be in the middle of the day when no one will show up. I mean, they put all these onerous restrictions. Yeah, and like, then limited the audience size. And then when they did have extra tickets, instead of giving it to students that waited in line all day long to come see Ben Shapiro, they were like, oh, we're just going to take these and not hand them out. So I do think that the administrators, while they did in fact relent at the end, they were giving YAF a really hard time because they didn't want to deal with this. So I don't know the notion that administrators are like, oh, we're trying to you know, help you guys, but we're in a tough position. It's semi-true, but it's also kind of semi-not true. And I, and I do think, just to follow up on that, your point is well taken, but if you're an administrator, especially at a government-run institution, you have to uphold the fundamental constitutional rights of invited guests and of students. And if you are, um, if you are indulging the heckler's veto over and over again and incentivizing more bad behavior, then yes, the problem is going to get worse. And you can you can point to rioters in the streets. I think rioters are emboldened every time they're allowed to riot with virtually no consequence, which is what happened t 
time after time in Berkeley until they finally brought in basically the entire Bay Area police force to let Ben Shapiro speak. <laughs> Like, we're, you know, we're not talking about Richard Spencer, you know, doing Heil Hitler's. This is, this is Ben Shapiro talking about, like, limiting government. <laughs> is it um, interesting to you, by the way, I, I'm curious about, is it interesting to you that the response to speakers right now seems to be, it doesn't matter whether it's Ben Shapiro or Milo or Heather McDonald, for goodness sakes, or apparently Alan Dershowitz um, or whoever it is. If you if you have views that are that someone is going to label as problematic, you, you get almost the same sort of response, uh, or at least it's the potential same response, right? It's I mean Charles Murray mm -hmm. um, is the same thing as Milo as, as everyone is that is that surprising to you? This goes to the overapplication of these words where they become yeah. meaningless. And by the way, I'm not a fan of Milo, right? He's not my cup of tea, to put it. <laughs> kindly. Um, and I am a fan of Ben Shapiro. It doesn't, the fact that I find this speech far more objectionable than this speech over here, even, you know, Ben and I disagree, I would agree more with this person over here. It, that shouldn't matter. Like, Milo is just as protected as Ben is just as protected as, uh, you know, I'm trying to think, like a totally anodyne quasi, like David Brooks or something, right? Like. Right. Like across the spectrum of center right, that's not a knock on David Brooks. It's just like, and David Brooks wrote a wonderful column about this whole problem uh, just recently about the Google issue. So I don't think David Brooks would object if you distinguish him from Milo. <laughs> no, 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 he's not. He's not, he's not exactly, exactly. So like, it sh it's not up to. It shouldn't be up to me and how I feel about someone to say they still have a, the people in Charlottesville with their stupid. Walmart torches, chanting horrific things, they had a right to speak. Like, we have to say that out loud. We have to say that neo-Nazis have a right to speak. That is what the First Amendment requires. And so we can draw distinctions between do we like the speech, do we abhor the speech. In this case, I abhor the speech. You still have to allow the speech to happen or else we go down a very dark path, some of the implications of which we've talked about here. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna come back to, uh, to Connor then on the question of which direction did this go? Is this a uh, mm -hmm. campus creates the culture or culture is, is impacting the campus? It, it goes in both directions. I mean, there is certainly, uh, as I mentioned before, there are certainly <laughs> academic ideas that have um, come up mostly in the humanities, especially among critical race theorists that just cannot coexist comfortably with a culture of robust free expression. Um, at the same time, I think that uh, technology is playing a huge role here and that you have a generation of college students who are not being acculturated to campus norms once they arrive on campus. They're <laughs> existing in a milieu of social media um, and Tumblr, uh, where um, ideas are spreading and their civic education uh, is not coming from school so much as uh, the people discussing these ideas. As well, it's a very strange, um, as someone who graduated from college right before Facebook and, and so never existed on campus at a time when, when social media was there, uh, it would be, I think it would be very different to, on one hand, I was reading about political ideas in newspapers and listening to you know, mass media, uh, television, radio. Um, for some of these students, their experience of politics is going on Reddit in some of the darkest uh, subreddits there and having anonymous speech directed at them that is some of the most awful things that you can imagine. And I know professional journalists who've been doing it for years and are still affected by this kind of thing every once in a while. So thinking of an 18-year-old um, you know, about to go off to college and experiencing the darker corners of the internet, I can see why they would be alarmed and feel insecure and have uh, different ideas about what discourse is and be alarmed for that reason. Um, I think it's hard for any of us that aren't having that experience at that age to really conceive of what that's like. Right. Yeah, everything I learned about civics, I learned on Twitter. <laughs> right. That's pretty frightening. Uh, right. And I think that is, that is true. I also think, because um, I went, we talked earlier about sort of um, 
the equation, uh, the, the equating of speech and violence. I also think there's this buzzword of safety, where it's sort of like I have a right to be, to feel safe on campus and some speech makes me feel unsafe. And that's why you get this whole lexicon of uh, microaggressions, they're these quasi-scientific terms that are sort of designed to get at a problem and sound official, but they're really abused as means of silencing speech. So uh, one of them is microaggressions. We, we write about it uh, in End of Discussion, and there's actually an academic who has devoted his entire, he's at, in the Ivy League, who's in, his, devoted his entire career to the study of microaggressions. Um, so this guy is just a blast at parties, as I'm, I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> um, and one of the things that he says is sometimes these microaggressions are insults so subtle that neither party fully understands what's happening. So be on the lookout for that. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the problem with that, though, and overuse of the word triggering and talking about privilege is not that, that you should be rude to people because you don't like microaggressions, right. not that PTSD is not a real thing because you think triggering is silly, not that people who look, frankly, like me haven't enjoyed a profoundly privileged uh, place in our society for a long time. Like, we should be aware of those things. It's when you start expanding the definitions so capaciously that it's, it's used to say a microaggression is sort of an affront to my safety and therefore shut up. Uh, you, are, you are triggering something, so shut up. You are privileged and your type has had privilege for a long time and therefore it's time for you to shut up. That's where you turn a corner into something that's a problem as opposed to a self-aware, like, pro-civility stance. Okay, so I, I want to make sure we have time for questions and we are going to have a microphone right there in the middle. Um, so, and you'll have to line up to be able to ask questions uh, from the microphone. But before we do, so I want to, uh, try for a, like a 60 second answer to the question, so, so what do we do about this? Um, if, if, you could do so, if you could do one thing uh, to try to reclaim a, uh, a more positive free speech culture um, on campus, and for that matter, uh, kind of in, in, in the broader culture, how do we do that? Um, Bree, I'll start oh, with you. All right, I'll start, <laughs> I'll go first. So I think, honestly, I think encouraging school choice is so important um, in just allowing parents to make more decisions about what kind of environment um, their kid gets placed into and kind of break up some of you know, the funding pipeline that is oftentimes tied with uh, stipulations about speech. I think that that's helpful. Um, but also I think, and Guy, I'm sure you're going to talk about this a little bit more, right? Uh, in regards to the fact that having discussions with people who disagree with you is becoming more and more rare nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, I currently live in a house where most of, all, everyone in my house is liberal, right? And they have different opinions. One of my roommates, um, and I live in like a group house, she has, you know, an I Stand With Planned Parenthood poster in her room. Um, and we get along really well and we talk about different things like that. Um, so I don't know, I guess surrounding yourself with people and encouraging that kind of environment. As you said, Guy, when you um, talked about and had lengthy discussions with people who disagree with one another, um, I think fostering that and encouraging that is helpful uh, in order to break this cycle. Uh, I think the most important thing uh, to protect free speech in America would be to have the federal government require every American to buy and read end of discussion. Um, and those who fail to comply should be jailed uh, or possibly executed. I'm still debating that one. Um, maybe I'll come down in a sort of a kind-hearted way and just jail you. Uh, I think to me, there's the big cultural problems, and you can't turn, you can't turn an aircraft carrier quickly, and it's a very slow, incremental thing. Um, I do think on the big issues, it is right to push back when free speech or free expression uh, is, is threatened. I, I, I'm hopeful that we can be consistent about it and apply it to our side and their side if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to take sides, um, and not to resist the temptation to escalate the outrage wars constantly and to apply 
the worst standards of the other side and, and adopt them for yourself and sort of this arms race that we talked about. And then a lot of it just does come down to the personal interactions. And I sometimes college students ask that exact question, what can I do? Have a conversation with a friend of yours or a colleague or a classmate of yours on the other side and set ground rules where for the first 15 minutes there is no name calling and no questioning of motives. You are just explaining to each other the reasons that you believe things. And you can ask questions and that sort of thing, but let's like have a moratorium of 15 or 20 minutes on assuming bad things about the other person, and maybe that could create some sort of uh, foundation of goodwill to realize that perhaps the, one, one of my favorite uh, reviews that we got on Amazon for the book was a far left person read the book and said, Benson and Ham are not monsters. Um, which we actually thought about putting on the paperback. Sort of, not monsters raised Jim from Vermont. Um, the problem is a lot of us view the other side as monsters or some gargoyle that are horrible people who want bad things for other people and bad things for the country. And I think for most of us that is not true. And having productive quasi-respectful conversations can remind ourselves that the other person is A, a real person, and B, probably not a monster, and probably not wishing ill for fellow humans or America. I, I share the broad notion that debate is, is the best way out of this. One of the best, one of the best events that I've done on a college campus, um, I was arguing in print with Jelani Cobb of The New Yorker about whether free speech was in fact threatened on campus. He thought that it was a distraction. Uh, and we went to Connecticut College and sat in front of a big room of people and debated. And I think having the students see two people who really disagreed model that debate could happen without anyone uh, getting harmed or throwing punches or anything <laughs> terrible. Um, it, it was uh, probably more important than anything that we said. Um, I, I think that, um, and I don't want the debates that happen to be between, um, you know, Milo and I don't know who the equivalent of Milo on the left is if there is one, but I don't want it to be. Um, Guy is thinking. I can yeah. I can tell. Yeah. I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah. I don't want it to be between people who are. Um, theatrical trolls who are not there to earnestly discuss th their viewpoints. Whatever your viewpoints are, that's fine. I just want you to actually be there uh, and earnestly hold those views and want to discuss them. Um, I, I think also on campus, the work that Heterodox Academy is doing is really important. The idea that um, the intellectual environment on campuses would be a lot stronger if there was more diversity of thought among the faculty. Um, and I want conservative and libertarian students to have real people whose office they can go and talk to about their ideas so that um, all of their intellectual role models aren't coming to them through uh, mass media, where we're, we're at a moment when what sells on mass media is standing up and yelling that the other side is terrible, um, or the kind of debates that you see um, on some kind of polemical talk show hosts who will find the worst person on the other side to come on and put on the screen next to them uh, and, and kind of laugh at having won the debate at the end, right? Um, so, so I think just earnest debate in good faith uh, and more events that pair um, conservative and like, that pair left and right speakers, both of whom suddenly have something to gain from the event going forward and something to lose if protesters shut it down. Right. As the lawyer, I'll just say, and of course, you sued them also. So, um, <laughs> but so um, okay. So we have some some time for questions. Just a few minutes for questions. Um, but you can line up at the microphone right there uh, and ask away. And we'll just stare at the microphone until someone does. Hi. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm a sophomore here at GW. Um, and my question uh, is more for Mr. Maddox. It's, um, so I'm a member of Young America's Foundation here at GW. And I'm wondering, um, specifically, this is a private university. And what kind of protections do students have at private universities um, to have their free speech rights defended? Well, on a private university campus, they're limited. You don't have uh, really uh, 
obviously you don't have First Amendment rights vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, GW. Uh, GW probably promised you when you came here, when you paid them uh, a significant sum of money, <laughs> that you would get a, uh, a marketplace of ideas, there would be a diversity of opinions offered, um, that student groups would be able to have, uh, you know, the student groups are an important part of the community here, uh, and their expression is, is vital to the flourishing of the mission. So they told you all those things, and then they took your money. So the answer is basically, uh, whether in an actual contract terms or just in terms of, look, this is what I'm paying for. Uh, you, you do have sort of a moral right, at least, to be able to demand that they live up to their side of the bargain if, not a, a, uh, if they don't have a legal obligation. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, obviously, uh, George Washington is in a different position than some other schools because it's private. We, we don't want to uh, necessarily start imposing on private institutions all the same constitutional rules that would, would apply to, uh, to public schools um, because they, they do have rights themselves uh, as a private institution, but, but they should provide a, a, a free marketplace of ideas here, so. Thank you. Sure. Hello, uh, thank you for being here. I'm a recent college graduate myself and something I would hear uh, argued by my left-leaning uh, fellow students was that Counter-protesting students who effectively shut down uh, speakers on college campuses, whether it's Charles Murray or Milo or whoever, are really just expressing themselves. And so if we're going to use the free speech argument in favor of certain people, what we're really doing is limiting the free expression of student protesters. Um, so how would you respond to that objection? Do we have to, do we have to be able to make space for some people's expression by limiting others? Um, yeah, what, how would you respond? Um, so, I mean, with free speech, I mean, there's always time, place, manner restrictions on those things, right? Like, you can't yell fire in a crowded room. Like, if I were to yell fire right now, I could get arrested. Um, so, you know, I definitely think that, yeah, there should be a forum for students who object to speakers coming onto campus, but as what happened with Charles Murray, I don't think shouting that person down um, and disallowing them from even being able to talk, I don't think that that's a free expression and a healthy discussion between those two parties, right? I think if students are upset about it, they should be able to voice their opinions, but I think they should be, do, be able to do so in the right time, in the right place, in the right manner, right? Like maybe holding banners outside the entrance um, or asking thoughtful questions would have been you know, a better way to do that. I don't know if y'all. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it is not free speech to shut down free speech. So if you're a student who really objects to someone who's coming um, to, to speak on your campus, there are many options available to you, one of which is not attending, one of which is being outside and holding banners and uh, you know, chanting slogans or whatever. Another is to s silently protest and not interfere with the speaker's right to speak and the audience's right to hear. These are invited speakers. People want to hear that that's what the event is for. To disrupt that violently or noisily and shut it down is, is the opposite of free speech. This is a very Orwellian argument that these people make. Uh, you, can make a, you can make a silent protest. So Attorney General Sessions spoke at Georgetown this week. And he was not shouted down. There were some students who, I think, put tape over their mouth and, and stood up silently and maybe turned their back. But that was it. That was a non-disruptive <laughs> statement that was made, um, which I think is a totally appropriate form of pushback. It's certainly preferable to some of the other, uh, you know, the other histrionics. And then I think perhaps the best way to make your voice heard uh, is to confront speech that you find objectionable with really sharp, challenging questions for that person. Get up, wait for a microphone, and take, take your shot and, and make it clear that you don't agree. And rather than ranting at the person, say, you know, how do you defend X? Or why do you believe Y? And, and let them try to defend themselves. And sometimes they can't. And they'll be very unpersuasive. And the audience will understand that. And you've done way more to discredit a bad idea than you would have by, you know, chaining yourself to sh something and shrieking. Uh, until the room was cleared by the 27 mandated security guards. Um, so that's, I think, I think there's, 
I think you can sort of shame them because that's, that's such, a, such a bad argument. I'd only add that the students making that argument imagine somehow that shutting down, say, Charles Murray, like, they're imagining contexts where they have the power to go to an event and shut it down by shouting the speakers down, right? Uh, and this is attractive to them in part because of the relationship of their ideology and the prevailing ideology on campus. Mm -hmm. But if the norms that they are suggesting uh, were to be applied broadly, uh, both on campus and off campus, it would not be uh, progressives who are protesting Charles Murray who were the ones being shouted down in the greater society. They're a tiny ideological minority uh, who would be, and so if you imagine, if that was what the First Amendment actually meant, which of course it isn't, um, you, you can imagine people crowding into religious minorities to their services that they don't like and shouting them down. You could imagine, um, you know, it would be radical feminists and, you know, far right Mormons. And it would be like tiny groups that lots of people were angry at that would be affected. It would not be a tool for the kind of social justice that these activists imagine. All right. Thank you. Hi. Thank you all for being here. We've discussed how some pockets are stifling speech. Um, however, it seems that this trend has also created an unlikely set of allies across the political spectrum. Could there be something hopeful uh, in this response to these challenges to free speech, perhaps like reinvigoration of constitutional values or something like that? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do think you know, the strange be bedfellows argument is an important one. So uh, with Berkeley, at, at the nadir of the Berkeley madness, uh, Elizabeth Warren, and Bernie, and we go after her in such delicious fashion in this book, you have to read it. Um, but Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders both came out and spoke, especially Bernie, <coughs> like pretty forcefully scolding the far left, saying this is not effective, this is not a good way to go about this. So, like I wrote a piece at Town Hall that day, like I think this, the title was something like in, in praise of Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, no really. Um, and give, gave them credit for doing the right thing and identifying people who even in the moment are allies for the, the broader good on these questions and, and not, and praise them fulsomely without any sort of uh, caveat uh, and just say, good, like, you know, thank you, Elizabeth Warren. Not something I'd say very often. Thank you, Elizabeth Warren, for calling out the Berkeley craziness for what it is. And I'm hopeful I don't know, Connor, you've, you've written about this and you've spoken a lot of campuses. I'm, I am hopeful that there is a sort of a class of uh, thoughtful people from across a very wide spectrum of beliefs who, who, form, who could form the basis for like a, a coalition against this overreach. Yeah, I mean, I, I keep hoping that the kind of tribal red-blue divide in America and the partisan divide between Republicans and Democrats isn't the only one that people think about, that they also think about the difference between um, authoritarianism and libertarianism, broadly speaking, and the difference between liberalism and illiberalism, and that the non-authoritarians and the liberals get together in a coalition against uh, the people who are in both red and blue camps. Um, I don't know if that'll happen, but I think that there are at least a decent number of people who are fighting to try and make it happen. Right. Let's make sure we get this uh, one last question, and then we can wrap up. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, speak briefly, since I believe the title of this event mentioned Charlottesville, um, if you could talk about uh, Antifa, just generally, because I think that they've got, um, on the one hand, I think a lot of those people, they, it's not that they misunderstand the First Amendment, they understand it and just don't think it's something that we should base society on. And on the other hand, I think that they've gotten a lot of sympathy, understandably, because people are very nervous about what this new administration, you know, in the wake of Charlottesville, the white supremacists feel emboldened. And yeah, you know, maybe it's not great to punch people, but hey, at least they're punching the right people. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I definitely think you are correct um, in that the way a lot of people talk about 
Okay, I was really surprised when Charlottesville happened, um, the number of people that didn't know what Antifa was. I was like, how, how do you not know what this is? I mean, what happened with Milo uh, at the, uh, and as Connor pointed out earlier, that you know, a lot of times these protesters that get that are there get trucked in, right? I mean, these are Antifa are people that come from all over the country in order to disrupt things and disrupt speech. Uh, and really, I mean, we saw a really vivid example of that uh, when Milo Yiannopoulos couldn't speak um, at Berkeley because they were literally smashing ATMs and wearing scarves around their faces and ski masks and all this other uh, nonsense. So I thought that that was a pretty interesting thing to come out of the whole Charlottesville thing is that a lot of people just didn't know what Antifa was or who these people are. Um, and I think the media is to blame for a lot of that, right? Just not talking about this ugly mm -hmm. faction that's on the very, very, very far left. And I don't even know if we can even categorize them on the left um, because they are just so extreme. So, you know, I, I think that I guess one kind of good thing to come out of Charlottesville. Obviously, it was a very tragic event when a lot of horrible things happened. But I guess one kind of good thing that came out of it is that it did shed a light on Antifa and who these people are and who their goals really are. Um, so I don't know. I guess I hope that we continue to talk about them, talk about who they really are, talk about what their motives truly are. Um, and I hope that we don't continue to see this kind of coverage or non-coverage um, that has kind of sheltered them for so long. I, I think that. Um Charlottesville strikes me as a case where um, it's almost the exception that proves the rule of if a bunch of uh, Nazis march into your town, um, it's absolutely protected speech under the First Amendment. And I think that there's an obligation to protect it. At the same time, I don't think anyone is being irrational by being uh, fearful of, of that happening uh, when a bunch of armed people march into your town from a, an extremist uh, political movement, yeah, there's good reason to be afraid. Um, I think that's probably the most sympathetic case you could make for Antifa is an event like that. Uh, and even in the most sympathetic case, they did not in fact prevent uh, someone from being killed uh, on the far right side. Uh, beyond Charlottesville, I don't think it's very easy to argue that they're uh, punching the right people, I think. <laughs> they've attacked a bunch of journalists. They've attacked a bunch of people who clearly aren't fascists. Um, they have acted as if their presence in Berkeley is preventing fascists from taking power. Uh, like, a fascist couldn't get a job as a dog catcher in Berkeley. It's absurd to think that you need Antifa to keep fascists from taking power in Berkeley, of all places, uh, let alone in the rest of the United States. And the norm that they are undermining, the norm that we don't go out in bands of vigilantes with masks on and just beat up the people that we don't like, um, if they were to succeed in eroding that norm, again, it, it, it's like how short-sighted do you have to be to think that if there were like an armed struggle between left and right in the United States, yeah. Not gonna the side that was really against guns mostly would win, and the <laughs> side that is armed to the tooth and had militias would, I mean, come on. It's just so short-sighted, it's absurd to me. And the idea, Antifa is short for anti-fascists, and I mean, it's, a, it's sort of a trite point that people, but like these people are thug fascists. Like that's what they're doing, stamping out ideas that they don't like through violence. Uh, and, and when you get to the, you know, punch a Nazi is sort of a popular thing on the left. They're selling t-shirts, punch a Nazi. Um, I have no love lost for Nazis, right? I'm not here to be like, oh, don't punch a Nazi because I like Nazis. I say don't punch a Nazi because if you have the t-shirt that says punch a commie, if you want to do a body count between the Nazis and the communists, you know, who's worse, we, we should not be hitting each other. We should be talking to each other. And Antifa is, is the most explicitly pro-violence uh, organization in the country when it comes to these controversies. So I, the left, and you know, they are not the left. It is grossly unfair to the left to say that Antifa is the left. Um, they're a tiny fraction of it. But I do think if Republicans are made to decry and condemn any extremist that can be described as a righty person, Democrats ought to self-police their side, too, and go hard after these Antifa people, because they're lawless bums. Great. Thank you all. Let's uh, give a round of applause <laughs> for the panelists. We're going to take a very quick break. There's some 
Uh, more Chick-fil-A. There's also um, t-shirts if you sign up for our website, which we're going to announce later um, during this conference. And then our next panel will be with um, our student um, client advocates who uh, stood for speech on their campus. And that will be moderated by Caleb Dalton, another one of our um, Center for Academic Freedom attorneys. So come back in about like seven minutes. So thank you.